Well, I'm going to start on you. There's some people here, but I guess maybe more people will watch the recording. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to first um, announce the minorities and philosophy map is holding a study hall. I sent out an email about the self or I forwarded the email. There's their poster. Holding a study hall on uh, May 27th in Humanities to 259 from 1 to 5 p.m. And uh, there will be free food provided. <laughs> and it says all are welcome. All right, that's one thing I wanted to announce. Also, I wanted to announce uh, one of our grad students, um, Justin Gray, and asked me to announce that uh, um, his two summer courses, because he says that enrollments are still kind of low on them. So he wanted to make sure people know about them. Uh, and one of them is in the first summer session, he's teaching metaphysics and epistemology which is still, I thought it said 315, but now I see I copied and pasted, it says 31S. Um, anyway, it's called Metaphysics and Epistemology, and in the second summer system session, he's teaching Phil 122, which is metaphysics. Um, so if you're interested in metaphysics and or epistemology, uh, to look into those. Um, and the third thing I wanted to talk about before I start talking about Rousseau is the final paper assignment. Um, so this is like a little bit longer than the other two writing assignments, six to eight pages. Um, and, you know, like this is supposed to be a, um, an actual paper with like an introduction and a conclusion and all that stuff, <laughs> um, uh, title, <laughs> um, uh, so there's a list of suggested topics, you don't have to, if they're suggested, that means you don't have to write about one of these topics, but uh, each one of them is pretty broad. I mean, they're, you probably already looked at this, but if you haven't, you know, they're pretty long and they're like <laughs> long, long topic with lots of sub questions. That's not like a list of like, you have to answer all these questions. Those are like, you know, like suggestions to help you start thinking about something, um, to think of an angle on it. Um, so, uh, um, so, you know, like they're supposed, to, all those sub questions are supposed to make it easier, not harder. <laughs> they're supposed to be like, well, maybe you want to ask this or this or this. Um, Professor, could I ask a question about that paper? Yes. Um, should we have like a very focused thesis that we maintain throughout that paper, or should we try and encapsulate like the broader ideas and just like do like the broader summaries and not necessarily have like a thesis directed paper to respond to those questions? No, it's uh, the idea is it for is it for to be for it to be as focused and thesis directed as possible. Yeah, so a summary is not as good, uh, you know, as uh, an argument about a specific point. Like it's, I mean, it's not supposed to be a test of like you remember everything from the course or something like that. It's supposed to be an exercise in writing an argument about this material. Now, when I say an argument about this material, I mean, like, uh, at least what I encourage and what all these topics are about is an argument about how to understand the author. It's not like an argument about what is actually the best way to set up a government or something like that. Um, I mean, for one thing, that's really hard. <laughs> so, or at least it's really hard to write a good paper about that, to like sit down and say, I think the best kind of government is whatever. <laughs> It's, it's easier to write a good paper about what does Rousseau think it is? And, and you, you know, you like, that's not the same as summarizing Rousseau because it's really unclear what he thinks it is, right? Like, I mean, this is what I spend all my time talking about in lectures, 
what 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 does he actually mean by this <laughs> right so there's a lot of questions about how to interpret these authors um, and the other thing is I'm suggesting that it not just be about one author but about a comparison between two authors yeah uh, so do you want your interpretation or our interpretation I want your interpretation with an argument for your interpretation okay. now I mean like if you happen to know that it disagrees with my interpretation then obviously like um you might want to even though like i'm not grading it dexter is great so you know but still if you happen to know that it disagrees with the art interpretation i've been putting forward in the lecture then you might want to provide extra arguments you know like show that you're aware that this is that I, that's not the way i put it but you know whatever like but make, make the paper as long as possible <laughs> don't make it as long as possible uh, no i mean um too long is probably worse than too short if only because dexter has to read all of them uh so but uh no i'm just saying like i mean maybe not extra argument is the word for it but like it's good to sh it would be good to show awareness that it's not the interpretation i pushing i guess would be one way to put it yeah do you have a question or are you just doing that? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, what else is here? Oh, I was talking about comparison, right? So again, that's, I always, in most of my courses, this is what I suggest. It's because, um, again, it's because I think that it's easier to write a good paper about like, so what is it actually that Rousseau and Locke disagree about or agree about? Um, so anyway, that's the suggestion. Um, you know, uh, like if you find you have a great thing to write and it's only about Rousseau, then or whatever, you should do that. Uh, but but I think it's better. And all the suggested topics are like this. That I'd like to ask you to compare at least two authors. I wouldn't suggest trying to go for like more than two, but but it depends because. Sometimes, you know, uh, you can make an important point by mentioning someone just once in a footnote, right? <laughs> like the whole paper could be about Locke and Hobbes, and then you could have a footnote say, but this is where we so disagrees, right? <laughs> but anyway, so that's the basic idea. Um, um, I'm not recommending necessarily that you use any outside material. Uh, um, you can if you want. Obviously, if you do, you have to cite it. Um, and, uh, and I think I said this at the beginning of the course, I'll say it again, which is that uh, um, I used to not say anything about plagiarism except just don't plagiarize, but now I, want to, I feel like I have to say a little bit more because there's been more of it recently. It's just like, you know, uh number one it's uh i don't and 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 dexter won't like almost certainly fail anyone for a paper that they actually it's an actual paper that they handed in unless we detect plagiarism and then you get no credit for the paper so like so uh, like if the paper is all quotes from Wikipedia with quotes around them and footnotes, then it's not obviously going to be an A paper, but it's not going to fail. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, that's one thing. But the other thing is just to realize that, I mean, I think most people know this, but I'm not sure that like, you know, just like paraphrasing the text, changing some words, whatever, doesn't make it not plagiarism. It's not, it's not about using the exact words. It's, you know, so, um, so if you do want to paraphrase the text rather than quote it word for word, that's fine, but you still should put a footnote. All right. Um, and I think that's all I need to say about this. Uh, yeah, I don't really care how you cite things as long as it's clear what you're citing. Um, there isn't really a standard format for citations in philosophy, like different journals have different formats. So I don't see any point in trying to teach one. 
Um, and are there any questions about that? Or... No? Okay. Back to the service. All right. Um, Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is, oh. So the first thing I want to talk about is the institution of the government. I think this is... There, there are kind of two and a half important things in this reading. One is institution of the government. The other is religion. The half is uh, slavery, which he doesn't say very much about, but he says something really interesting and weird about it. So hopefully I'll talk about all three of those. Um, okay, so institution of the government. So... Uh, uh, So remember, first of all, that as far as sovereignty goes, so sovereignty is the expression of the general will. And as far as sovereignty goes, uh, it can't be represented, according to Rousseau. It can't be transmitted to someone else. Um, right? Does it, you know, um, uh, that's his fundamental argument about against any kind of representative legislature, right? The, the person who is making the laws uh, can't be a representative of the people. It has to be the people. So, um, On the other hand, so right, this is like can't be transmitted. Also can't be divided. Right? There's no question about the internal organization of the sovereign. The sovereign is just all the people, period. <laughs> but on the other hand, force. So force in both the state and or the government. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a second. This like can be transmitted. It can be represented. So why is that? Like um, so, right. So first of all, this is where Rousseau says this. This is a book chapter 15 on page 219. Since the law is merely the declaration of the general will, it is clear that the people cannot be represented in the legislative power, but it can and should be represented in the executive power, which is merely force applied to law. Um, so Rousseau doesn't really explain why there's this difference, but I think you can kind of figure it out from the reason he gave to begin with for why uh, a will can't be represented. And um, he said that a will can't be represented because like, if my, if my will happens to agree with your will, that's just accidental. Um, there's no guarantee that our wills will agree tomorrow. Right, so like if I'm if if I'm the assembly of the people, the sovereign, and I'm trying to choose someone to represent my will, I'm trying to choose someone whose will is going to be the same as mine. But I can't do that. The most I could do is find someone whose will is the same as mine now. Now, so why isn't that? Why isn't there a similar problem with force? So, like, I think the reason is precisely because. The will acts through general laws. 
where the force is applied to particulars. <coughs> so for one will to represent another will would have to mean that their principles are the same, right? Like the general principles on which they operate are the same. Because they're going to have to, this one is the representative is going to have to make the same like universal laws that the representative one makes. Whereas in the case of force, like all we have to do is ensure that the force is applied to the same particulars that the represented force would have been. Or I guess to put it differently, like no matter how many particular cases two wills agree on, they, that still doesn't make them the same. But in this case, all we care about is agreeing in the particular cases. So this is why there can be a government that is a representative. And so uh, notice, like, this isn't necessarily clear to begin with, although I was arguing this maybe not the most understandable way last time, that um, this paragraph, like this, this, this whole like double thing is in this one paragraph I was just reading on page 219. It is enough to understand how the government represents the sovereign. It starts with, However, to explain how the tribunes sometimes represented it, he's talking about like institutions of the Roman Republic, but the, the explanation is it is enough to understand how the government represents the sovereign. So here we have the government representing the sovereign, but then he says, since law is merely the declaration of the general will, it is clear that the people cannot be represented in the legislative power, but it can and should be represented in the executive power. So, um, like this, I think, again, is, is hinting at what I was trying to argue through Rousseau thinks last time, that the government, in a way, is a representative of the sovereign, of the legislative. Um, but in another way, the, gov the government is a represent representative of the state, the people considered as subjects because that's where the force is. Um, so um, I think if you understand that that's what's really going on, then it's easier to follow what Rousseau says about how the government is instituted. So the problem of how the government is instituted, and you know, when Rousseau starts to talk about this, he mentions that double aspect of the question that I mentioned when I talked about it, right? I mean, of course, it's no fair because I already read that before, but, <laughs> so, but uh, he mentions that double aspect that I mentioned, namely that on the one hand, there's a question of the form of the institution of government. Is it gonna be a monarchy or whatever? But on the other hand, there's a question of who's actually going to be appointed to like to be the monarch, for example. So, um, and again, the problem is, so the first part can definitely be done by the sovereign because it's a law. But the other part is a particular act, so it can't be done by the sovereign. So it should be a function of the government to do that. But there is no government yet. Um, so how is that going to work? And you know, this is what I said. Like Locke doesn't seem to notice this problem because he's not as strict or doesn't regard this distinction in the same fundamental way that Rousseau does. You know, Locke is just like, oh, and the legislative will appoint the you know the executive. Um, but Rousseau is like, no, the legislative can only pass laws. It can't appoint anyone. Um, so, 
So uh, this Rousseau talks about this in book three, chapter 17. And I'll start reading here on page 222. The problem is to understand how there can be an act of government before a government exists and how the people, which is only sovereign or subject, can in certain circumstances become prince or magistrate. Right, so like, This is the same diagram I, I kept going back to last week. The sovereign is the assembly of all the people, quay citizens. The state is all the people, quay subjects. And in between is the government of prince. Right? So he's saying the question is how the people who are only sovereign or subject can, in certain circumstances, become the government. And um, so the way this works, according to Rousseau, is that the sovereign decides what the form of the government is going to be. And then, like, temporarily institutes a democracy says, right, but for now, the government's going to be a democracy. And then all the same people sitting in the same place they were before kind of like take off their sovereign hat and now put on their, their government hat, right? Because in democracy, as I said, like all three of these are all the same. So we have a temporary democracy. So that means like these people can just switch over to this role. And then they choose, so like, I mean, of course, if what the sovereign said is we're going to be a democracy, that's where we stop, right? But let's say the sovereign said we're going to be a hereditary monarchy. So then uh, everyone sa says, okay, but as the, on, on the way to becoming hereditary monarchy, to becoming a temporary democracy, we all become the government. And as the government, we appoint the king. That would be the procedure. Um, Right, so Rousseau says, this is also on page 222, this takes place by a sudden conversion of sovereignty into democracy, so that without any noticeable change and solely by a new relation of all to all, the citizens having become magistrates pass from general to particular acts and from law to its execution. So, um, This is a little bit worrying, I guess I would, you know, you might think like, hold on a second, like what gives them the right to, how do they get around the problem? But I mean, you can see on one level, it's easy to see how it works. Namely that a democracy is the only form of government that doesn't need that other step. So the sovereign can, can, can institute a democracy without only with the law. Right, the law says everyone, so that's so it's okay. It's a universal law, right? It says everyone will be a magistrate. So we don't need a government to set up a democratic government. So the sovereign can set up a democratic government, but the sovereign can also make a law saying the democratic government is only going to vote on who's going to be the king. Um, so, um, right, so that's what he says a little bit farther down here. Thus, the peculiar advantage of democratic government is that it can be established in actual fact by a simple act of the general will. After this, the provisional government remains in power if this is the form adopted, right? That is, if they decide to be a democracy, then this government will remain in power or establishes in the name of the sovereign the government prescribed by the law. And thus, everything is in accordance with the rule. Um, 
So like in a way that answers the whole puzzle, right? There is no problem because, because we forgot that there's a form of government that doesn't need that executive action to come into effect. Um, even though Rousseau thinks that, in, right, remember Rousseau thinks that that democratic form of government in general is a bad idea. Um, it's impractical and it will also corrupt the legislature. So, um, uh, but to have it provisionally for this one purpose, I guess the idea is, well, it's not so bad. Um, however, I think it really um, goes farther than this. And I don't know, like maybe I'm reading, um, more into this than Rousseau says, in, at least in this passage. But I'm gonna quote something that, that sounds more like he agrees with what I'm saying, which is that in a sense, the, like this democratic government is the real government. What do I mean by that? Well, like, um, it's the only one that the citizens can be, or the subjects, I guess I should say, it's the only one that the subjects can be obliged to obey because the sovereign can make a law saying, and can make a law, the sovereign must make a law <laughs> saying that um, everyone has to obey the collective force of the state. I mean, that law, maybe I shouldn't even say the, that's, that's why I say this goes farther. Like in other words, it so makes it sound like there's a special trick that the sovereign does to get through this, right? And if, sort of if they didn't think of it, they would be stuck or something like that. But uh, I'm saying that, you know, this law, the sovereign doesn't even have to make that law because, and this is what I was trying to argue last time, that the, that's the essence of the social contract. Right, that the force of the state is going to be like brought against whoever violates the laws. So what I agreed to, what every subject agreed to when they entered the contract was, yes, to obey the laws themselves, but secondly, to uh, facilitate the use of the whole force of the state to enforce the laws. So. Um, so the force of the state um, used to enforce the laws is like the um, intermediary between the sovereign and the subjects that the subjects are automatically required to obey. I don't know if what I just said makes sense. Are there questions? <laughs> So, so in other words, what I'm saying is like really, you know, the reason this works is because this this really is the government when we set up the state. It really, you know, the real situation is that the same people are doing all of these functions. They're making the laws, they're obeying the laws, and they're enforcing the laws. Yeah. But I don't understand how there could be any like distinction between like in this sense, like the what does he want? He wants like representative aristocracy or something or elected aristocracy. Yeah, elected aristocracy and in in just like how this just sounds purely like democracy. How can it be? Well, no. So, I mean, when I said this is the real government. <laughs> I mean, but remember that government, because it's a function of force, can be represented, right? So, so like what happens when the state is instituted is that this becomes the government because this is the real government. But this, but a government has the, unlike a sovereign or a legislative, has the ability to appoint a representative. And that's, and as Rousseau says in that quote, I was reading from chapter 15, they can and should, right? They should represent, they should elect a representative. So, um, I mean, 
they should do it according to law, right? The sovereign is going to tell them what kind of representative to elect, and but then they're going to do it. So, so this real government like disappears behind the scenes because the actual governing is being done by its representative. Um, but um, but the real government is still the government. <laughs> now, why do I say that? Well, um, Rousseau says, so Rousseau says, first of all, Rousseau says that the sovereign assembly has to have legally appointed times for meeting, right? That is, there have to be times when by law, the sovereign will assemble and no one has to convoke it. And I mean, uh, um, as far as its function of sovereign, it's clear why that is because um, as Rousseau says, like, let's suppose it's the sovereign has made a law. Now that means that at a certain time, the general will expressed itself as this law. But how do we know that the general will still wills that law? So Rousseau says, well, it's by tacit consent. Right, if the general will wanted to revoke it, it would. And since it hasn't revoked it, it's still in effect. But if there, we didn't know when, if ever, the sovereign would reconvene, then that argument would be no good. Right, so there have to be regular times when we know it's going to come back. But um, but so I mean that that explains why there has to be a time when it will assemble and you know I mean this is like the reason he's specifying this so carefully is that both in the history of England and I guess in some ways even more so of France it became uh, a big issue that the king had the right to to like um, say when Parliament or the um, States general were going to meet and when they would be dissolved, right? And like what, you know, in England, that like in the events leading up to the Civil War, there was the long parliament, right? Like they, re they refused to dissolve, even though the king told them the parliament's over and they just stayed there. Um, whereas in France, the like the kings throughout the uh, 17th and 18th century like refused to call a meeting of the States general at all. <laughs> never met right so i mean there's they're thinking about you know rousseau is thinking about that but um, um so uh yeah so it's clear why there has to be a time when they when they're going to meet and no one can interfere with this but he adds something else which is that every time the assembly meets it starts by voting on the following two questions, which he says, you know, can't be modified or suppressed. And the first one is, does it please the sovereign to preserve the present form of government? So, right, so, I mean, uh, That thing that, that according to Hobbes can never happen and according to Locke can only happen in really special circumstances, according to Rousseau happens every single time the sovereign assembly meets, right? As, as soon as the sovereign assembly meets, in effect, like uh, we go back to the original state and say, what form of government do we want? It's only a little bit modified, right? It says, does it please the sovereign to retain the current form of government? I mean, I guess that's because like Rousseau thinks the answer should almost always be yes, right? He doesn't think we should keep changing the form of government all the time, but sometimes it should be no. And we have to make sure that there's no, no way of preventing the sovereign from voting on that. So that part is fairly easy to understand. But then the second question is, does it please the people to leave its administration to those who are now in charge of it? 
right? And that I think is what shows that the democratic government is the real government, right? When the people actually get together. So first you act, ask the sovereign, do we wanna keep the same form of government? But then right, Rousseau deliberately changes. The first question is, does it please the sovereign? But the second one is, does it please the people? So they've done that same thing that they did to begin with, right? They've suddenly changed hats and they're now acting as the government. And they're asked, right? So like, let's say we're a monarchy. First we ask the sovereign, should we still be a monarchy? And then assuming they vote yes, then we all change hats and become the democratic government. And we say, okay, should so-and-so still be the king? Um, and assuming these assemblies are pretty often, so Rousseau says that, it, I mean, Rousseau's history of the Roman Republic, I think is, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I just, I have the impression that it's questionable in various ways. Uh, like he's kind of idealized things or uh, exaggerated things or whatever. But anyway, Rousseau says, yeah, the entire Roman people often met more than once in a week. <laughs> so like so these these meetings are going to be pretty regular and uh every time they happen we're going to begin by asking whether the king should still be the king so i mean that that shows you number one as i said that the democratic government is the real government so to speak but not just in theory but like it's really running it, it really is running the state through its representatives Right? I mean, if you're the elected aristocracy or the hereditary monarch or whatever, you know that like next week, <laughs> the, all the people are going to assemble, briefly become a democratic government and decide whether you're going to stay in office or not. <laughs> um, so, um, This is not something they did in Rome or Sparta, <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> right? And it's not clear, like, if it's really practical, like, if a government could work subject to that kind of, right? I mean, just, like, even facing elections every four years is pretty disruptive. <laughs> this is basically, like, they, I mean, there's no provision for, like, competing candidates and whatever, but still like this is this is kind of like having a general election every week. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so that's the way Thoreau, I mean, Rousseau, why do I keep, I know why I keep confusing back to the same name, Thoreau, it's Rousseau. but anyway, um, this, uh, this shows to what extent Rousseau really, not even with respect just to the, the legislative, but really with respect to the executive, really thinks that every legitimate state is a, is a pretty radical democracy. Um, and that now, rather than saying there have been very few, we might we might have to say there haven't been any. <laughs> um, um, now, what the other thing I wanted to talk about in connection with this, though, is I wanted to go back to the like metaphor of the. Um, comparing the state to an individual with a will and a, you know, you know, a body that obeys the will. Right, so like, remember when Rousseau starts to talk about this, he first starts out with this example of how like, if I want, uh, in a 
act of walking somewhere, there's two factors. One is the will. I decide to walk there. And the other is force. My body actually walks there in response to the will. Um, so, you know, what goes between these two things that's analogous to the government? Rousseau says it's the unity of the soul and the body, but that's not like, I mean, um, that doesn't sound like a thing, right? <laughs> it's, um, I mean, the government is an actual, like the government is an actual entity that does something. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I don't think, I, I don't know if you could say that there's a thing here and maybe, well, I mean, there is and there isn't, I guess. But like, I think, first of all, you could think of it this way, that um, the force of the body is available to the will only insofar as the body is like regarded as an organ of the will. Um, so this is the thing I promised I wouldn't talk about last time. This is what Neoplatonists call the organic cause um, or instrumental cause. Because, you know, when Aristotle defines the soul, he's, he defines the soul as the first entropy, which is like perfection or actuality or something of an organized living body. And uh, although like a kind of straightforward interpretation of Aristotle, it would just be that the body is organized and living because it has this entelechy, whatever it is. Uh, the Neoplatonists understood that to mean that there's like three things here. There's like the soul and there's the organization and there's the body. So there's something kind of like, um, there's a property uh, that inheres in the body that makes it fit to receive the soul or something like that. Um, and then they generalize that to like the world soul and, you know, and there are other levels of emanation or whatever. But this fortunately for you, it's the person you'll play with it. So, um, so I think, I mean, you know, without introducing a lot of heavy duty metaphysics here, I think you can understand like the, I mean, put it this way, not just any body. I remember um, there's something, one of my teachers, Hilary Putnam used to talk about the, uh, the bomb theory of consciousness. And he, he was like, who is Baum? L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> right? So the Baum theory of, of consciousness is that anything can be conscious. A scarecrow, a sawhorse, you know, like whatever. You just like, right? So, um, but it's like, that's not what it's like in real life. <laughs> not just any mass of of matter, no matter how much force it has, is suitable to be the organ of a will. It has to have a certain, um, it, it has to, there has to be a way of collecting its force and using it all together. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's because of, I think it's because of this difference. I guess I should say and divided. Right? The will is something simple. Um, it can't be, it, it's not extended. Right? And I'm saying this here without um, necessarily talking about in a metaphysical sense, a simple substance or something like that. Right? It's just like regarded as will. It can't be, it can't be transmitted from one thing to another or divided into pieces. 
So it's, it's like one and simple, whereas the force that it commands is always going to be extended and divisible. Um, so um, there has to be some uh, um, I mean, what we call organization, <laughs> right? I guess, I don't know if you know this, but organon means tool in Greek. It means like a, um, a tool, that's what it's, right? <laughs> like a piece of equipment or a tool. Um, so when, when Aristotle describes the body as organic or as the organ of the soul, he means like the body is usable by the soul. As, a, as an instrument. Um, so, uh, not that like it's raised without pesticides or something. So, right, so the body has to um, have this like kind of, or at least uh, the, the best way to connect this simple thing with this extended, divided thing is by way of like central organization. So there is kind of a thing in here, like the brain, or according to Descartes, a pineal gland, <laughs> right? So, I mean, in, again, in a sense, the force that the will commands is the whole force of the body, and that's the real brain. Kind of. This actually kind of connects to something that Nietzsche says about like the, the you know there's a bigger and wiser intelligence standing before you. It's called your body. <laughs> anyway, but never mind that. So in a sense, this is like the real brain, but it needs this representative in order to be usable. Um. um And this also suggests that um, it also, I think, helps to explain what Rousseau means, what he meant when he said way back one in chapter in book one, chapter eight. Um, page 167. Um, if the abuse of this, he's talking about, right, like how we should regard the transition from the state of nature to the civil state. If the abuse of this new condition did not often lower his condition to beneath the level he left, he ought constantly to bless the happy moment that tore him away from it forever and that transformed him from a stupid limited animal into an intelligent being and a man. So what does he mean by that? So like in this like literal case of the individual, the question is, um, I mean, you might ask, I guess put it this way, you might ask, isn't there a disanalogy here? Because we said that in this case, the will can only will general laws. But like in the example of me walking somewhere, wasn't my will directed at something particular? Right, like I wanted to walk to this table and my body did it. So, you know, I think, the answer is towards the bottom of the same page to be driven by appetite alone is slavery. And obedience to law one has prescribed for oneself is liberty. So it's like, it's not true actually that if I walk to this table just because of some particular relationship I have to this table, like I want it, I want to eat it. That joke, but um, you know that that it's not actually true that I'm willing it. I'm just like um, following my appetites, blindly following my appetites. 
But in a state of nature, there's no way for me to distinguish those things. Um, so, um, you know, I need, I need a way to distinguish between what is uh, just appetite and is intrinsically directed at particulars versus what is will and establishes general principles. And then it's dependent on, I mean, um, it's dependent on both the perception of the body to apply the general principle and on the force of the body to enforce the general principle. Just the same way that the sovereign depends on the government for both of those things. Um, and that is depends on really on the real government, the whole all the whole state for those things. Yeah. So when you say, when you say that, <clears throat> like the distinction between the will and the body, like can't be made in the state of nature. Like which state of nature is this? Is this like free language, or is this like? But I'm still not like the same. Yeah. Well, so remember, that's one of the puzzles about going from the discourse to the social contract is that, like, um, he doesn't refer to, to, to any of those stages, and it's not clear what stage he's talking about. And he seems to be um, rather like Hobbes or Locke, just contra contrasting the civil state of a legitimate commonwealth with anything else, right, that came before it. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, yeah, it, I guess it really changes. It's a good question because it could really change the meaning of the passage that I read before, right? He ought constantly to bless the happy moment that tore him away from it forever and transformed him from a stupid limited animal into an intelligent being and a man, right? So if you think of that as like the acorn gathering stage, you know, like the discourse, like the original primitive state of nature, then you might think it means something like, um, you know, took him out of this primitive state of living like the other animals and brought him into this kind of like civilized thing, right? Like the kind of thing that Hobbes wants out of the civil state. But I think, that's not what he means. As, and I think, as, again, as you can tell from what he says at the bottom of the page, I think he means that when, you know, as long as there is no uh, um, representation of a general will that I have to obey, um, no matter how refined I might be in some respect, I, can't, I don't have a way of distinguishing between what's merely my appetite and what's my will. Did you have a question? I was just uh, wondering, like this transition where the person becomes like his will becomes subordinated to the, the general will. Um, isn't it just, uh, it's almost like appetite because it's like uh, he has to, like out of fear of consequences or whatever that he's doing it or she. Well, yeah, well, it's not clear that it's or she according to yourself. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't or she in Sparta or Rome, right? Uh, and uh, it doesn't seem like it's or she, according to Emil. But anyway, yeah. Um, so, uh, um, well, I don't see how that's like a civilizing force. Like, if it's just, you know, yeah, again, it's not about civilizing. I mean, I don't even think, and this is actually one of the things Wol Wollstonecraft is going to say against Rousseau. She's going to say Sparta, that's like the heart of barbarity. I mean, like ironically, given that barbarian originally means not Greek, right? <laughs> you know, but he, yeah, she's like, that's not, that's not true civilization. Um, but, um, but yeah, I don't think he, uh, in, uh, Rousseau doesn't really think civilization per se is such a great thing. 
you know, with that uh, quote that you just uh, yeah. Made there. So it's not about that. That's what I'm saying. I I think it, I again like it, it, if you if you think of the kind of like like bestial original state of nature where human beings according to the, in the discourse where human beings are um, only a tiny bit different from all the other animals. <laughs> Right, then you could understand it in that way. Like becoming a member of a commonwealth makes them like literate and all that stuff. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about, and so like if the subject agrees out of fear of consequences, like obeys out of fear of consequences, but the sovereign doesn't command, the citizen doesn't command out of fear of consequences. The citizen commands out of, or should command out of their opinion about what the general will is. So like on, um, this is book four, chapter two on page 227. When a law is proposed in the people's assembly, what is asked of them is not to be precise whether they approve or reject the proposition, but whether or not it conforms to the general will that is theirs. Each man in giving his vote states his opinion on this matter, and the declaration of the general will is drawn from the counting of votes. Um, and I'll just read a little bit more. When, therefore, the opinion contrary to mine prevails, this proves merely that I was in error and that what I took to be the general will was not so. If my private opinion had prevailed, I would have been doing something other than what I had wanted. In that case, I would not have been free. <laughs> right? So, the, you know, um, the general will really is like what it, it's the part of my will that's really universal. Um, and that's what I need. I need to isolate the part that's really universal in order to, that's, that's in other words, that's genuinely a will <laughs> in order to be free. Um, and uh, the questions that are put in the assembly of the people are questions that, that allow me to make that distinction. Now, I mean, if there's factions or whatever, then that starts to break down and people start that, you know, like I, I think you can understand how fragile Rousseau thinks this might be and how um, and how how much it might depend on establishing a certain, like if you would say a certain culture, right? Like certain manners and whatever in these people, because it's really important. And when they're asked this question, they don't think. What would be in my interest? And I hope that that we win, right? And like maybe try, like try to make deals with other people so that the ones that's in my interest will come out. I'm, it's really important that instead I think like the question isn't should we make this law, but does the general will will this law? <laughs> does did that help at all? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um Yeah, so again, this is like, like paradoxically, you have to be forced to be free. You can't, you can't be free on your own. Um, and this again is, is in some way really close to Kant, although in some way it's still really far from Kant. I, um, but um, I mean, although so, uh, wait, have people have people had con any Kant ethics at all, or like, does it make sense for me to talk about it a little bit? Okay, well, all right. So I won't assume that everyone knows about it, but I just say that, like, you know. Um, when you read like the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, it kind of sounds like uh, um, yeah, the moral law is basically a, a matter for individuals. 
this and uh you know and the uh, the issue is just like not even how to find out because you know you already know <laughs> what in your will is universal now we mean absolutely universal right that like any rational being could will the same thing or that you can at the same time will that every rational being should will it or you know something like that right so but when you get to the metaphysics of morals itself where he like gives the details of his system it turns out that in a state of nature like um and he that's where he discusses the difference between a civil state of nature and he calls it a state of law right a civil state and he's you know it turns out that in a state of nature like most uh moral imperatives don't have much to them because for example like he says that um he agrees with Hobbes that in the state of nature, you have a right, perhaps even a duty of preemptive attack against a neighbor who seems like they're getting too strong. Right? So even though in theory, property doesn't, you know, is like derived from the moral law and doesn't depend on the state and whatever, property rights aren't worth much, much in the state of nature, according to Kant. And therefore, he says in the metaphysics of morals that in the state of nature, you have a duty to force as many people as you can to leave the state of nature <laughs> if necessary you have to you have a duty to force them to so it's like again it's not that far from Kant but still there's some kind of difference obviously um all right um that I think is everything I wanted to say about the institution of the government and various other weird things that are connected to it in my mind. Um, are, there, are there questions about that before I go on? I'm still a little confused about the whole democracy thing. <laughs> okay. What is, what is confusing about it? Like, I just don't understand. Um, like, are you saying that like this, like, like, the structure of like the, the state and the sovereign and then like the government between them it becomes one in a sense in democracy and well i mean no but these become just three different ways of looking at the same group of people By the way, as I said last time, I don't know if, you know, like, it looks like what Rousseau is saying is, like, could be, could be seen as telling against Hobbes' materialism or assuming that materialism is wrong, right? Because we have these, you know, the soul that's distinct from the body and whatever. But in, at least in the metaphorical case, it turns out that the soul and the body are not it's the same matter looked at different ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So they don't all become one, but they but they do. They are all the same people fulfilling three different functions. You know, the reason he says that the democratic government shouldn't. I mean, again, he gives two reasons that a democratic government should only be provisional, right? But uh, but as I pointed out, it's not just provisional. It also comes back at every assembly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but why it shouldn't be current? But it shouldn't be the the ordinary day to day government because number one, it's impractical. We can't have the whole people assembled constantly, and number two, uh, it's actually not good for the same people to constantly fill, fulfill both of those functions because it because of what I was just talking about. It tends to confuse people's minds between questions of right and questions of interest. Because when they're the government, they're thinking about particular cases. Um, is, is that still confusing or? Less so. <laughs> and, you know, Rousseau realizes that he's making really like subtle, abstract distinctions here that might seem silly when he talks about the institution of the government. But then he says, but, but 
like the English Parliament does this in something like this in real life, and I'm not really sure. I don't I, I don't know the details of what the English Parliament does or did. British Parliament. Okay. Is this after the Act of Union? When was the Act of Union? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> English or British Parliament. Um, uh, but they have some thing where they adjourn as a parliament and convene as a committee of the whole, and then they act as a committee, and then they adjourn as a committee and report back to the. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if there's something like this in our. Uh, I've heard the term committee of the whole before, but I don't know. All right, so so I mean, his point being, I guess that. Uh, I don't know, like, what does that prove? Maybe it just proves that the English parliament is full of weird ritual <laughs> procedures. <laughs> um, but, um, but I guess he takes it to prove that, yeah, it's a subtle abstract type of distinction, but it actually can be important to the function of our state. Um, okay, are there more questions about that? All right, so I'm going to talk about slavery. Not for too long, because I really want to get to talk about religion. Um, I mean, the main place he talked about slavery was in book one, chapter four, which is titled Of Slavery. So, um, and like what he said there was, uh, that there's no legitimate but, uh, basis for slavery. Except, I mean, I think he does leave a loophole. I think maybe he even intends that this loophole should be taken advantage of, that um, slavery could be imposed as a punishment on, a crim on an individual crim criminal. Um, that, of course, is the same exact exception that still exists in our constitution, for better or worse. Um, but, uh, um, but, but anyway, other than that, like on the one hand, he says no one can voluntarily enter this state. And then he says, as far as the justification that Locke allows for it, which according to Locke is just the extension of the way it could be used to punish an individual criminal. But Rousseau says this, this situation is completely different, right? Like a victor in a just war, according to Locke, has a right to kill the combatants. And since they have a right to kill them, they have a right to do whatever is less, like for example, enslave them. So Rousseau just says, no, uh, like uh, in, no matter how just the war, as soon as the combatants lay down their arms, they become civilians and you're not allowed to kill them. And therefore you're not allowed to enslave them. So, um, um, so basically the, the, the conclusion of the official chapter on slavery is that there's no such thing or almost no such thing as legitimate slavery. But then when we get to book three, chapter 15, um, this is on page 220, and he's talking about what was it that allowed the Greeks to have, what is two? No, sorry, 219. What was it allowed the Greeks to have um, democratic governments? relatively democratic governments. Among Greeks, whatever the populace had to do, it did by itself. It was constantly assembled at the public square. It inhabited a mild climate. It was not greedy. And then its slaves did the work. <laughs> its chief item of business was its liberty. So, um, so it turns out, I mean, like, as I mentioned before, that although slavery is, he proves that slavery is completely illegitimate, his big example of Sparta, like, 
only works because they have so many slaves. And he, it's not like he's forgetting that. He actually brings it up <laughs> as something that made a democratic form of government work in these circumstances. Um, so uh, he's kind of evasive. So like, again, it's not like he doesn't notice the contradiction here, right? The first thing he says is what? Can liberty be maintained only with the support of servitude? And then he says, perhaps the two extremes meet. Everything that is not in nature has its drawbacks and civil society more so than all the rest. Um, so he's like, eh, maybe, yeah, maybe sometimes it's illegitimate, but maybe sometimes, uh, you know, a well-constituted commonwealth can only be supported by slavery. Um, but I mean, I think he doesn't mean that the Spartans weren't wrong to have slaves exactly, but, um, Right, I mean, as he says, I do not mean by all this that having slaves is necessary, nor that the right of slavery is legitimate, for I have proved the contrary. I am merely stating the reasons why modern peoples who believe themselves free have representatives and why ancient peoples did not have them. Um, so like, I think his point is that the ancient peoples were wrong to have slaves. But at least having they did by having slaves make themselves free. Whereas this, so this is the continuation of the first paragraph I was reading. There are some unfortunate circumstances where one's liberty can be preserved only at the expense of someone else's, and where the citizen can be perfectly free only if the slave is completely enslaved. Such was the situation in Sparta. As for you, modern peoples, you do not have slaves, but you yourselves are slaves. <laughs> right? So what do you, because according to him, like uh, living under a representative government, let alone obviously an absolute monarchy is being a slave. Right? Like remember what he says about how the, he says that like the, the English people think of themselves as so free, but actually they only become free very briefly when they vote for parliament. And they always misuse that. <laughs> and then they go back to being slaves. So, um, um, so like, I think his point is, although it's really not 100% clear, um, and is, yeah. is he saying that slavery is like essentially like like a like um like a tool that can like give people freedom in the context that they are not in a state of nature? I understood up to the what do you in a like con like because like because. People can be free, but they also cannot because they're in a state of society rather than a state of nature. Oh, I see. Well, no, I mean, because like what he's saying in this book, at least most of the time, there's some places where he seems to use liberty a different way. But most of the time, again, he's saying you can only be free in a civil state. You can't be free in a state of nature. Um, but, it, but, you know, but like, uh, it may be, um, given the land you inhabit and the character of the people and the surrounding peoples, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's what he means by unfortunate circumstances. There may be unfortunate circumstances in which the best you can do is to form a little state that really is free, but depends on all these other people being enslaved. I mean, is that really the best? Like, wouldn't it be better to have a, a less legitimate state where there weren't so many slaves? Uh, 
Um, but 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 Rousseau, I mean, he's he's as extreme as Hobbes in his own way, right? He's like, well, that's anything short of a legitimate state really is slavery. Someone else's will is commanding you, not your own will. So um, whereas this, I think, I think he, you know, again, he thinks this is a bad thing to do, but and so I, that, the thing that's not so clear to me is like, if the Spartans asked him, should we do this, what would he say? <laughs> like, would he say, well, it would work, but don't do it because it's wrong. Or would he say, it's wrong, but you should do it <laughs> under the circumstances. Uh, that's, that's what's a little ambiguous. Um, but um, um, but I, I think he really does think it works, so to speak. This is the thing, I mentioned this before, I didn't read it, book three, chapter 10. The dissolution of the state can come about in two ways. This is on page 213. First, when the prince no longer administers the state in accordance with the laws and usurps the sovereign power. In that case, remember the prince is not necessarily an individual. Normally the prince would be like the body of the magistrates. In that case, a remarkable change takes place, namely that it is not the government, but the state that shrinks. I mean that the state as a whole is dissolved and another is formed inside it, composed, of exclus composed exclusively of the members of the government. And that is no longer anything for the rest of the populace, but it's master and tyrant, right? So again, it's like, at first we have this elected aristocracy, this is the government, and this was a representative of the force of the state, you know, at, um, at the, uh, um, in the name of the sovereign to enforce the, the laws made by the sovereign. But at some point, this government decides, um, we don't want to do that anymore. We just want to take control for our own purposes. So Rousseau says, um, at that point, there's still a state but this, these people aren't part of it anymore because they're not parties to the contract. Whereas these people, at least if they do, like if they look after even their private interest properly, their interest qua government properly, these people will set up a compact. And so um, like, these people now um, are a sovereign and a state and can set up a government inside their government. <laughs> um, and um, all these other people are neither citizens nor subjects. They're just slaves of this state. And like, I, I think, among other things, he must be thinking about Sparta when he says this. I think this is what he thinks the structure of Sparta was. Um, so it's like, there really is a free people here, only what it's doing is kind of bad. <laughs> um, uh, So I don't know. I, I don't have much to say except to point that out and, and to point out that it's that it's it, it still ends up ambiguous exactly how he feels about this. Um, of course, you know, he says, oh, you modern people don't have slaves. So I mean, this is something that a lot of Europeans say in the 18th and 19th century. And it's kind of weird because it's the height of the slave trade. <laughs> but there are no slaves in Europe. That's what they mean. <laughs> right? They don't have slaves. Um, uh, but anyway, so but um, so like what he what he thinks about this really egregious form of slavery that's actually going on, we don't really find out. At least not here. I'm sure he says something about it somewhere, but you know, but. All he says about modern slavery is that um, 
uh, everyone in Europe is really free. And there are, except maybe in Switzerland, <laughs> the happiest country in the world. <laughs> Did you have a question? Or? Okay, that's all I'm going to say about slavery then, unless there's questions. Um, yeah, Hegel also has this whole explanation of why we don't have slavery anymore because it's inconsistent with the principle of Christianity. And like, again, he's writing this in like 18, I don't know, 13 or somewhere around there. It's, it's kind of odd. Um, oh no, actually, I guess that's a, that quote that I'm actually thinking of is from, yeah, in a way it's even worse. It's from like 1830. <laughs> All right, anyway, um, okay. So now I'm gonna move on to the topic of uh, religion. Um, so Rousseau discusses three or possibly four different kinds of religion. Um, Um, and of course, he discusses them all uh, in the context of asking, you know, how they fit in with a properly constituted state, right? That's what he's interested in here. Um, so the first one, he calls it the religion of man. I think you might call it the religion of reason. Um, this, so he describes this, this is in book four, chapter eight on page, uh, 246. The first without temples, altars, or rites, and limited to the purely internal cult of the Supreme God and to the eternal views of morality is the pure and simple religion of the gospel, the true theism, and what can be called natural divine law. So, um, right, so this is supposed to be true Christianity. In the sense that um, this is what Rousseau thinks Jesus actually meant when he said, like, I've come to set up a spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, that type of stuff. That um, he actually meant, uh, you know, the content of religion is that you should uh, obey the moral law. Um, and that you should, like, worship the true God internally if those are even two different things, maybe they're the same thing, right? So, um, so like Rousseau, I guess you could say, like he thinks this is, he thinks this religion is true, but <laughs> this is the really weird, like, so, I mean, this is a type of distinction that a lot of people would make. Um, between this and the other types of religion we're going to discuss, but a lot of philosophers would make. But, you know, usually when philosophers make it, they say, and of course, ideally, we would all, this would be everyone's religion. Um, maybe people aren't capable of that, maybe they can't understand it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But like, this is the religion we want. But Rousseau says that um, this religion would ultimately be bad for society. So it's like, it's true. This is the way you should really worship God, but it wouldn't be a good idea for society if everyone started to think this. Um, and uh, so this is, he describes this on 
on page 247. Um, the reason is far from attaching the hearts of the citizens to the state, it detaches them from it as from all the other earthly things, uh, as from all, yeah, as from all the other earthly things. I know of nothing more contrary to the social spirit. We are told that a people of true Christians would form the most perfect society imaginable. I see but one major difficulty in this assumption, namely that a society of true Christians would no longer be a society of men. <laughs> so like, what's the problem here? And, you know, again, the sense in which this is Christianity is not like it believes in the Trinity or something like that, right? It's the sense in which it's a true Christianity is the idea is that, you know, that Jesus really meant don't have a religion. <laughs> like, um, don't think about theoretical doctrines, you know, just um, like think about your duty to the true God, what God really wants from you, which is to be, to be moral. <laughs> So, um, and that what is what Rousseau is saying is going to be is counter to social spirit. <laughs> so how could that be? Well, um, so So he's, Rousseau starts off with a case in favor, right? He says, each man would fulfill his duty. The people would be subject to the laws. The leaders would be just and moderate. The magistrates would be upright and incorruptible. Soldiers would scorn death. There would be neither vanity nor luxury. So all that sounds good for the state, right? What's the problem? And he says, but... <laughs> um, Christianity is a completely spiritual religion concerned exclusively with things heavenly. The homeland of the Christian is not of this world. He does his duty, it is true, but he does it with a profound indifference toward the success or failure of his efforts, right? Because what counts in this religion is your intention, right? Like the purity of your will. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, also something about the afterlife. I'm not sure how how serious Rousseau is about that or how much that has to come into this religion, although that definitely makes it worse, right? But I mean, I mean, put it like, I think the way Rousseau would really want us to understand this, it's, I, I think, I'm not sure. Maybe he's just like Locke. Right, like Locke says that, you know, you should follow the divine law without any thought of your own private interests and whatever. But the reason is because your real private interest is you're gonna get eternal reward in the next life, right? So um, like, may, I'm not sure if Rousseau means that or not, but, um, um, but in any case, like leaving that aside, the point is that, you know, what God wants from you is the right intention, the intention to do your duty, to do your best. And Rousseau says, like, that's not what a soldier should have. A soldier should have the intention to win, <laughs> not to do their best. <laughs> right? So, Ray, he tells, he tells this story about the army of, yeah. To my way of thinking, the oath taken by Fabius's soldiers was a fine one. They did not swear to die or to win. They swore to return victorious. And they kept their promise. Christians would never have taken such an oath. They would have believed they were tempting God. Right? The Christians would, would swear to like win or to die trying to win, doing our duty. All right, I could go on more about this, but uh, I see there's only five minutes left, and I want to if we briefly introduce the other two kinds of religions. The second one is called the religion of the priest. 
And I guess, I mean, you're supposed to think, and Rousseau mostly talks about Roman Catholicism when he talks about this kind of religion, but he also mentions some other examples. He mentions Shia Islam when he talks about this, the cult, the uh, sect of Ali, right? But the truth is, I think he makes it pretty clear. He thinks it applies to Protestant churches in Europe too. Um, and um, so this is like somehow derived from Christianity, except what happened was that, um, um, somehow this otherworldly kingdom got turned into a real world kingdom. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Rousseau says that's what the pagans always suspected the Christians were up to in the Roman Empire, right? The Christians were said, look, you know, we're, our God isn't a political God. Our God is not of this world. We're, we can be good Christians and good Romans. But the pagans thought, yeah, you're just saying that until you get a chance to take over. And then it will turn out that your God is just as political as all the others. And Rousseau says they were right. <laughs> the pagans were right to suspect that because that's exactly what happened. <laughs> right? When Constantine converted to Christianity, all of a sudden there was no more meekness and whatever. Right? So, um, so Rousseau says, like, this is just obviously bad for the state because now there's two separate centers of power that are in competition with each other. The same thing Hobbes says about this, basically. And in fact, he mentions Hobbes as one of, he says Hobbes is one of the few people who have realized um, uh, how bad this is, but he says Hobbes didn't understand how it's, it's inseparable from the nature of Christianity. It's inseparable from Christianity because it starts by saying, no, we're not the same as the political power. We're otherworldly. But then that otherworldly, supposedly otherworldly power starts to become a real power. So now there are two. Rousseau says that's like guaranteed to happen in Christianity or any other religion that's similar. Um, uh, in fact, I think he in some ways traces the problem back to Judaism, but uh, in any case, um, the third one is what he calls the religion of the citizen. And this is the best one for the state. And what is this? So as, so as Rousseau describes it, he says, this is the religion that all the early cities had, although he doesn't really have any examples, <laughs> uh, unless you count the Old Testament religion as he understands it. That's his only example, basically. But he says the way it was, was that uh, each, state had one god that was their god <laughs> and uh like they expected their god to fight against the gods of other states <laughs> and hopefully win um and so like religion and politics were connected but with were like but inseparably Right? It's like, of course, what the God, what the God of what our God wants us to do is defend our city and do the, you know, uh, beat all the other cities. Um, so, yeah. So instead of like, because with the second one, you said that there's like kind of like two, like an otherworldly part of the world and then like the worldly part and they're kind of like at odds whereas like the religion of, religion of the citizens is like they're they're still at, at odds but they're both like of the earth in a metaphor no i think the point is they're not at odds at all right like like the like the but their gods compete when they go to war right isn't that what you're saying oh yeah but like but but there's no competition between a religious and a secular authority in the state oh, okay okay Right, so like the state and the God are on the same side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I, 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 I can't really take a question because there's only one minute left and I haven't even mentioned. Um, so, I mean, so like all I can say is Rousseau says this kind is great for the state, but there's a problem with it, which is that it's based on deception. <laughs> um, right, which that goes back to what he said about the lawgivers, like pretending that God was telling them stuff. Right, like the way this works is the person who's really in charge of the state, let's say it's Moses, you know, comes down from a mountain with these tablets and says, God told me, you know, to tell you to do this. And, uh, um, and God told me we should fight these people and we're definitely going to beat them. So God's on our side, you know, um, but like he's just making that all up. <laughs> And again, like in a way, it's not a deception because in a way it's true that God wants you to do that, that like this is the reasonable way to be a people or something like that. But um, in these circumstances, but it's like, if you imagine, imagine making a contract, Imagine, so like instead of the situation people keep mentioning where someone holds a gun to your head and says, like, sign this contract or I'll shoot you. And then everyone except Hobbes agrees that, that there's, no, there's no contract there. Imagine instead of that, they say, here, sign this contract because God told me you should sign it. And suppose you believe them, right? They, they do a miracle or whatever. <laughs> so, and afterwards it turns out they, that they were making that up like the miracle was the, the trick they did, you know, can they defend themselves by saying, oh, but look, I can prove that signing that contract really was in their best interest. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't the fact that it was done, signed under false pretenses just make it invalid, even if it really was the best thing for me to do? That's, I guess, is the question here about this. And Rousseau seems, He seems worried about it, but maybe not as worried as he should be. I don't know. I'm I'm over time, so I I'll, I'll just say like if you ask him what religion should we have now, he says none of these, <laughs> and he says that he says what we should do is just require everyone to agree to certain basic articles of belief, and one of them is tolerance. Right, so like, and not just tolerance in terms of let other people be, but tolerance in terms of you have to agree that um, people who believe in other relation, religions can be uh, saved just as well as in your religion. <laughs> so the state should impose that. I don't know if there's some, there seems to be something weird, like deceptive and or coercive about that as well, but I don't have time to talk about it. So I'll see you next week. We'll talk about welcome practice. Uh.